I'm Martha Devi, and uh, you saw me an hour ago, and you're going to see me now. Uh, but I'm really, really happy to uh, introduce this next part of our uh, program, which is a screening, a private screening of the book um, uh, Join or Die. And for those of you who were in attendance all day, you know that um, we were trying to keep our introductions short so that we could spend more time chatting. And I have to tell you, it's, a really, it's really hard to keep the introduction for someone like uh, Professor Bob Putnam short. Um, so I'm gonna just give a few highlights and then I'm gonna talk about his, his colleague, uh, uh, Pete Davis as well. Uh, Bob is a professor emeriti at Harvard University and kind of the preeminent voice when it comes to this issue of social connection and meaning and purpose and, um, uh, and sort of community networks. I could recite all of his books, but we'd be burning up the entire time. Um, but his seminal work that the movie is based on was the uh, book he published in 2000 called Bowling Alone. And I know we have a number of young people in the audience who probably weren't even alive when that book was published. Uh, I was alive, very much alive. And I actually remembered it as a, I mean, it really did impact the way I thought about my community, the absence of my community. And I'm one of those who tried to start behaving differently after I read it. So Bob, I wanna thank you for that. You're um, welcome. <laughs> We've talked about, we talked a couple of times over the course of the day about how our community connections are in crisis and that that erosion has been happening over the last 50 years. And it's had an impact in civic organizations, social organizations, and beginning to have a polarizing effect on our sort of national discourse. So um, the movie and the premise really sort of put, puts out the idea that we are in crisis around this, the absence of social connections and that we really need to do something about it and that it does affect every generation. So we met Pete Davis and I, I think Pete, your story is really interesting as well. Uh, Pete is a writer and a civic advocate from Falls Church, Virginia. Um, and he was a student, Bob's. Uh, he, right now he continues to work on civic projects aimed at deepening American democracy and so solidarity and he's the co-founder of the Democracy Policy Network, and he's had policy pieces uh, written in most publications that you would have read. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time before the movie um, actually sort of talking about the backstory, uh, asking Bob how he got involved in this and um, asking Pete how he got involved in it. And we're gonna save some time for questions at the end. Um, but Bob, I think, can I, oh, by the way, uh, Rebecca Davis was supposed to join us as well. She's one of the other co-producers, but she had a last minute conflict, but um, thankfully we have Pete. <laughs> um, so Bob, can I ask the camera, can I, we see him on this monitor in front? <laughs> Otherwise I'm gonna be looking over my shoulder. I, I can see no. you. You can see us? Very clearly. All right. Um, <laughs> no, I'm getting an error message on this one, but. <clears throat> so Bob, you're a political scientist and your focus was on comparative politics. Um, and I was curious to read that you wrote about democracy and arms control, which seem well, kind of far apart from any interest in social capital and social networks. Uh, can you tell us how you ended up writing Bowling Alone? Uh, yeah, first, I want to thank you and the um, uh, Longevity Project at Stanford for, uh, I, I'm, I'm having a little bit of a problem because I'm hearing me speaking and I'm also hearing me from the audience. So maybe I can, I can, can, can you, can you, your end, I don't keep hearing you. We're having trouble with the audio. All we need to do is for someone to turn and mute you for speaking. I, 
I can't yeah. We're I'm trying to work the technical the, issues. The problem is that I'm hearing myself back with a delay uh, two seconds. It's really difficult to focus because I'm hearing me two seconds later. Um, I have here has been divided basically in two parts. Um, um, the part I, I I should put it this Bob, way. can I make a, can I make a suggestion while we sort through this? And they just cut me off. Pete, maybe I'll start with you and your your backstory, and then when we uh, and then when we can. <laughs> Yeah, you know, this is this is a story basically that this movie came together um, in two rivers basically, and I'll tell my story and my sister's story of how we came to make this. Um, my sister's story was that she was an NBC News journalist, and she was seeing the symptoms of, and she was an NBC News journalist for ten years, traveling around the country, seeing the symptoms of what Bob has written about in his life. She was seeing, doing video stories on opioid ec epidemics. She was doing video stories on mass shootings, on extremist politics, on a loneliness epidemic and suicides, um, teen suicides, all these horrible things that we've been seeing in the news in the last 15 years. And she was very hungry for something that wasn't at the branches, what uh, Henry David Thoreau would call the branches of evil, but rather the root, um, wanted something that struck at the root. And meanwhile, um, I took this class 13 years ago. And this is also a story about how a class can change your life and become such an obsession that you can't get it out of your mind until you make a whole movie about it. <laughs> um, which is um, 13 years ago, I took this class with Bob and we were all government majors. And we thought politics was about the presidents and the constitutions and maybe the economy for some of them. And what Bob was telling us was that Wait, actually, there's a big part of American democracy that's not from the top. That's about the ordinary neighbor to neighbor interactions, the ordinary civic life that actually forms the foundation of what in the title of his first like huge book about um, democracy in Italy is what makes democracy work. And I was so taken by this because um, you know, it was just this totally alternative way of looking at what happens in the news, looking at these symptoms that my sister was seeing, which is, you know, usually when we see something in the news, we say, oh, someone at the top should do something about that. Um, maybe we need a different person at the top. Maybe we, need a, maybe we need to change something about our constitution. Maybe we need a slightly different thing in how the economy works. And that is all very, very important. We've seen what happens when you don't have a good person at the top. Um, and, but, what Bob had showed is that there's actually this really empowering story underneath, which is that maybe there's something we can do, all of us as ordinary Americans can do by having, um, by creating civic clubs and not just civic clubs that work on serious things like civic clubs that directly address these public problems, but even the goofiest civic clubs like pickleball leagues actually buttress and form, you know, and strengthen our democracy. and you know, we felt like there was a moment where people got to have that conversation 23 years ago. And we wanted to do a service to our generation of being like, you know, I think it's time for people who exactly as he said, weren't alive when Bowling Alone originally went viral to have a second bite at the apple to have this national conversation about the importance of what Bob talks about in his work. Hopefully the audio is fixed so Bob can say that much more eloquently. I was gonna, Bob, are we on with you again? I'm hearing you. But I'm getting the feeling that um, uh, time, time. So turn your volume off while you're speaking and then turn it back on when you're done speaking. Would that work? Um, yes, I now, yes, can you hear me? Great. Um, I'm sorry, I know you just think, um, thanks, Pete. Um, Remind me now, Martha, the, the, the question that you want me to ask right now. I was so taken up with me, with the technology that I didn't focus on. The, um, yeah, I, I think. Um, <laughs> my, my, <laughs> mine back on. <clears throat> All right. Can you hear me now? Yes. OK, great. <laughs> So given your, your sort of long and varied background, and my, my, what struck me was that, you know, you'd written a lot about um, 
democracy and uh, and other social issues. Like, how did you end up taking on the issues of social networks and social co uh, connectivity? Can you give us a backstory that led to the writing of Bowling Alone? Sure. Now, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, well, the the uh, of work that you described, you're referring to this thing about democracy and arms control and so on, actually it was a reflection on a time when I personally worked at the White House, because in 1978, I happened to be, well, I didn't just have it, I was fortunate to work on the National Security Council for Jimmy Carter, and I, this is not a place to go into great detail about that, but that's where that story comes from. But meanwhile, in the back, the background, the background of all the work that I was doing at that, that point, point, there was this there long, was long study, study that had begun, done, as Pete said, in Italy, Italy in 1990. I happened to be in Italy for some other some reason, reason. Um, um, for another for study. 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 And, the and the Italians happened, happened at that, that point, point, as the movie, the movie very clearly lays out, without any help from me, happened to create the conditions for a remarkable experimental study of where democracy works and where it doesn't work. And I don't want to go down that lane far, because that's what's in the movie. But what I will say is that for the next 20, 25 years, my family kept going back and back. And each and time we went back, we would add something more. more. So at the, at the beginning, when I began that began project, that project, my daughter, my daughter who is now a professor, now a professor at the University of Pittsburgh, and it's in her mid 50s, when, when I began, I began <laughs> she was about two or three years old. When I finished when I this finished project, project, she had graduated. graduated from from so this is a very, very long, long project. 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 And, it and it wasn't until in the very end of the movie will show. That I began to realize what I had been, what I had learned, and I had learned something I think really important: that these connections that I came to call social capital, the connections that we have with our friends and family and neighbor, and partly it's the formal groups, um, uh, but partly it's you know informal things like soccer clubs or pickleball or picnics or dinner parties, all the many ways in which we connect with our family and friends and neighbors. I learned in Italy the importance of those factors, which I came to call social capital. And then I came back to America. And back in America, I was, I was, began to be worried, not as a scholar yet, but just as a citizen, that America seemed to be going to hell in a handbasket. And um, so now we're, we're sort of in the middle, uh, middle 90s, middle sort of, yeah, we're in the early 90s at this point. And nobody else quite recognized it, but I sort of looked around and I said, gee whiz, I wonder if there's any connection between what I've been studying as a scholar, social capital, and what I'm actually worried about, which is the, the fate of American democracy. After all, the, the, the label on, the, on that first book was making democracy work. So I thought, gosh, maybe I can, and what I found was, and this, I'm gonna summarize, uh, bowling along the book um, in about one sentence here, that social capital, that is our connections with other people, were steadily declining. I was shocked at that. I had no idea before I began doing research that that was true. And it wasn't only true for PTAs, which is the, where we first noticed it, or bowling leagues, where we also noticed it, but even picnics. There was a national picnic crisis, we discovered, because the the, the number of picnics per capita had gone in a in about 20 years, gone from five picnics per capita a year to two picnics. And that's now down to most people don't go on picnics anymore. I'm not even sure whether your audience will know what a picnic is. But it that but it used to be that all Americans would spend a lot of time picnicking. I'm using picnicking here obviously it's a true fact, but I'm also using it as a kind of a metaphor for all the different ways in which we connect. That to my to Pete's astonishment and my astonishment, I, I finished that book in 2000. That's almost a quarter of a century ago. And it's more relevant today than it was when I wrote it. That's the other really shocking thing. 
I'm I'll I'll done uh, I'll, I'll I'll stop filibustering here, Martha. I, my follow-up question was going to be, um, I, I, as I said in the beginning, it certainly caused me when I first read it in 2000 to think very differently about my own life, um, and I think I've made changes. But why why are we still in crisis? Uh, any thoughts on why we didn't sort of step up to the call to action? Um, there are several possible answers to that. Maybe I didn't call loudly enough, although frankly, I was um, screaming to the rooftops trying to get people to take advantage of it. At the time, I think it's fair to say, maybe people didn't quite recognize that we were in, we were in trouble. Um, I, I was in a situation in which I was talking to people in the White House. I'm now talking about the, the um, uh, first Bush White House. And they said, you're crazy. There's nothing wrong with American democracy. We're stronger than we've ever been. Um, and this was when, you know, the Berlin Wall was falling and, and uh, the South Africa had been turned around and they thought at that point they thought things are better than ever it's a boom time for democracy and i didn't think that but i couldn't get everybody in america to realize that that's why it's a funny feeling for me now at last everybody i don't think there's anybody in america who thinks america is doing just fine now but i mean people disagree about what's what's wrong but we have we're incredibly polarized and unequal and and so on and and socially isolated and at last, people are paying attention. Now, there's a separate question, Martha, and I think you ought to talk to Pete about this. And that is, so, okay, suppose I'm right. What do we do about it? Because um, we still haven't fixed the problem, even though I've been shouting to the rooftops about it for, you know, going on a half century. And so I think Pete has the answer. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, gosh. <laughs> okay, Pete. <laughs> I... I want to get to that answer in a second, okay. but could I, could I say one praise of Bob here that made us want him want to make a movie about him par partially for the story of his origins here. And then I'll get, I'm, I'm just filibustering until I get to the answer. But um, <laughs> one thing that's amazing about Bob's journey to this work that we really wanted to capture in the film, just on the first topic, is that Bob came to it honestly as a social scientist. So many people come to community, including me and my sister making this film, because we were predisposed to like community. We wanted to have Bob's finding be true. Um, most of the people that were writing about community at the communitarian wave, it was called, in the 90s when Bowling Alone was, went viral, were because they were the type of people that liked to talk about community. Bob started his Italy study saying, I will follow the data wherever it goes. And what he found was that community was key to making democracy work. And I think that adds extra credibility to what he's saying. You know, a 20 year study, he could have found it was economics, it was the constitutional design, it was religiosity, it could have been whatever. He found that it was community and, and really highly recommend this book before Bowling Alone, Making Democracy Work uh, to prove that out. Now, why didn't kind of the last communitarian wave take hold? Why didn't we solve all of America's problems? You know, my theory of, um, and many of kind of the young people that are followers of Bob feel is the case, is that in the last wave, there was a sense of, you know, we had the presidents talking about community. There was a sense we should join more voluntary organizations. There was a sense, you know, volunteering would be good. Civic life would be good. We even got a program passed called AmeriCorps, now celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. That was about, you know, a, a getting a couple, you know, a, a good chunk of young people doing national service. Um, but what was missing in that era was that it was kind of community sprinkled on top was the best we could get. The structure of society would all remain the same, and maybe we'd get a few more people joining clubs, a few more people volunteering, a more, few more people throwing picnics. Um, what I think we need in this wave is we need community to almost um, make an intervention into all of the institutions. There needs to be a community spirit across all of the different sectors that actually changes the structures of those sectors, which I know you're all talking about here today. So go sector by sector, they need to have a community conversation. Just how the sustainability green movement said, we need people to 
make every sector sustainable. We need to make every sector more communal. Housing, how can we have more um, communal housing designs, more mixed income uh, developments, even more co-housing structures like they have in Europe that have more shared amenities. In the economy, how can we make work be more community friendly so that when someone needs to take off work to attend to community obligations, they're not given a side eye for doing that, let alone you know, having structures in work that are community structures like unions. Uh, take urban design. You know, There's a new urbanist movement that's really strong among young people that says, how can we decide our streets and cityscapes to be more communal? Take health. How can we... Um, have more things like participatory care, where it's not just the doctors helping you or nurses helping you with health, but the community participates in your health and recovery. One of the most successful recovery programs is AA and 12-step programs. It's a total community solution. The diagnosis is you have a, you know, an issue with uh, addiction. The, the um, prescription is more community. We need that across way, way more aspects of health. And so one of our challenges with this film that we're trying to prod is, can we get each of you thinking in your own daily work, whether you're in education, health, housing, urban design, just a boss or just the way you want to run your family, can you make it more communal? So it's not just sprinkled on top, but it's really, as Bob likes to say, a real moral revolution in our country to say we don't just live for ourselves. We are a we. We're not just a collection of eyes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, we heard the... We heard that the importance of the social connection throughout many, many of our panels today, whether it was people talking about financial literacy and preparing for retirement or physical spaces and community. So, um, so uh, Bob, I'm gonna ask you a question then I'm gonna come back to Pete with a follow-up. So you published a book in 2020 called The Upswing, How American Came Together in a Century Ago and How We Can Do It Again, where you sort of compared today to the Gilded Age uh, another era of sort of great disparities and inequalities. Can you give us some optimistic comments about how we can come out of this? Thanks for asking that uh, question. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, uh, there are a lot of lessons. That the point of that book was to look back at this earlier period. The last time we went through this kind of crisis as a country in um, at the end of the 19th century. And we draw a lot of lessons. I'm gonna see if I can limit myself to quickly to, to three or four, so you'll get a sense of what we're talking about. First, it's young people. All of the people who were the most creative people in that period, who were coming up with new ideas and implementing them and seeing that they could work, were people under 30. Most of your audience won't know that the expression don't trust anybody over 30 goes back to the student upheavals of the 1960s. But now I actually think it's true with respect to who's going to who's going to fix this problem this time. How are we going to get another upswing? And it'll be young people. Old people like me have the advantage that we've been around long enough that we know it doesn't have to be this way. But it's the young people right now. It's my grandchildren who are going to be able to come up with new ways of, of connecting with one another that fit the way that we will have come to be. That is, uh, they can think forward to how are we gonna connect, how is America, how are Americans gonna connect in the, you know, the 2030s or the 2040s or 2050s? I'm, I can't. So number one, youth people, young people is crucial. And therefore I take heart from the fact that right now, young people are voting almost more than ever before. And they're, I hope that's true in, in 2024. It certainly was true in 2020. And, and people like Greta Thunberg embody what I'm talking about, young people. They embody, she, uh, she embodies it in yet a different way that Pete alluded to already. A second, this is a second um, lesson. When you look carefully at what happened when in the first in that first time, back in the 1890s to 1910 period, the crucial first step was, to my shock, I'm a social scientist, to my shock was a moral reawakening. And I would love to give you the, the details story about exactly how that happened in, in quick words. It's, it's, it was a matter of moving from um, the so-called social Darwinism, which was basically everybody is out for themselves, 
to something called the social gospel in which uh, religious people initially said, You've got to, we've got to begin looking out for one another. Our obligation is not to ourselves. It's, we don't want an I religion. Our real religion is a we religion. And actually every religion in the, that I know of says it's important to do for other people. But we in that period, we'd gotten away from that and we've gotten away from it now. We're living in an I society right now. And that I'm not talking about please everybody go to church. I'm talking about the underlying moral issue. And we before we can begin working on uh, uh, you know solving problems and so on upstream of all that is and upstream of political out uh, political forces upstream from that is do we really care about one another so that's the second major lesson third major lesson and i'll be i'm trying to be quick here um it, it, revolutions like this and indeed most revolutions are not top down they're bottom up the real the really important innovations of that period and of this period if we can make it happen are coming at the grassroots they're you know they're coming in east palo alto frankly or in up here in new hampshire i'm in a little town called jaffrey it's going to be places like jaffrey or it's going to be you know as it was uh the last time around it's going to be places like um i don't know someplace on the gulf coast or or you know middle america it happened last time mostly in flyover country and so therefore what i'm trying to say is my a a sign that we're moving in the right direction will be if there's a lot of revival of people trying to fix local problems in local communities of course many of these problems have national dimensions i and they did the last time but you got to begin by trying out in the laboratories of democracy that's and that term by the way the laboratories of democracy comes from this period it was invented in this period because people were conscious that they were trying out different ideas some of them would be dumb and not last but some of them turned out to be fabulously important um i two more quick lessons and then i'll um shut up one um the la there were problems, there were serious problems that went, un went unattended the last time around. And one of them, frankly, was um, the we that we were building was not diverse enough. It, it did actually encompass women. Some people misunderstand that, but this first wave was when women got the suffrage. So it's not that, I'm not saying we solve all the issues of gender. Clearly we haven't, but I am saying they were not had left out so much from that. But blacks and other minorities were and that's a lesson we've got to learn this time, in a sense, a negative lesson. This time around, we've got to pay much more attention to making this we an all-encompassing we. So this means all of us in this society, not just, you know, upper-class white males. Last point, quickly. As we look carefully through these, this kind of history, you're tempted when you look at history to see a march of history, kind of a history determining everything you know, it's all we're all the prisoners of the history that we've inherited. And we want to emphasize that is not true. The the jargon, the academic jargon for this is agency. That just is to say we can make a difference. Now, we won't necessarily make a difference. It's not guaranteed that things are going to get better, but we are the ones, and we are the only ones. There's nobody else who's going to fix this problem for us. It's us. So either we all act together and i mean by we all i mean especially as i've said young people unless we all act together it's just going to get worse and worse it's not going to correct itself and i'm even i'm thinking both long term about let's say global warming and i'm thinking short term about who wins the election next week next year that's not it matters a lot who's going to win the election next week and that's not determined yet it's up to us i'm sorry that I went on so long, but I tend to get a little passionate about these things because I really care how it works, how, how this comes out. Doing a good job at trying to light a fire under all of us. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, uh, Pete, you, the, the um, film premiered South by Southwest in March. Yep. Tell us what's been going on since then. Who's been watching it? What are they doing? What the, re what the reaction is and what your plans are? going forward. You know, we are on one of the things we, you know, we're eventually hopefully going to be on streaming by mid next year, but um, we are, we do not want you to watch the, don't tell the streaming partner, but we do not want you to watch this movie alone. We want you to watch <laughs> it together. 
And so until that happens, we are going on a huge community tour, and we've been on one since March. And what's it really shows how much this theme touches people because we're meeting with hospitals or mayors or union halls or political parties or campuses. Everyone wants to talk about community. And so one plug I'll give is if you want to, after you watch this film, if you like it and want to bring it to your institution or campus or city, go to joinordie.film and bring it where it's snowballing all across the country. And what's so great is that it is a catalyst for these types of uh, conversations that all these institutions want to have. And people are coming up to us after this and telling us their community stories. We're hearing people saying, you know, I'm struggling with the nationalization of my Lions Club. And it's ripping apart because everyone wants to talk about what they heard on Fox News or MSNBC and fight with each other when 10 years ago we would have been um, working on a local service project together. And then I'm hearing, and like, we need to change that and relocalize our clubs and our politics. And I'm hearing from young people who are coming up with exactly as Bob's saying, not necessarily going back to the old clubs, even though they're doing amazing work, but they're inventing new ones. You know, someone came up to me in Austin and said, I started a queer skate club. We go skating once a week and then the other part, once a month, and then the, uh, the other meeting, we protest at the state capitol <laughs> and we switch off. And like, that is the type of, um, that is the type of uh, new civic, the, Bob kind of coined and popularized this term in the last chapter, the greatest chapter of Bowling Alone, civic creativity mm -hmm. that we're seeing popping up. And so um, I, I hope the movie can be a spur to more of that civic creativity. Uh, I promise we would have time for a couple of questions. I ran over time, but are there any questions? I just one, one quick, can you hear me? Um, I just um, want to make one, one quick point about the movie. Pay attention to the style of the movie as you watch it. It's not masterpiece theater, you know, the way these BBC kinds of films that are slow and languid and lovely and lots of talking heads. This movie has lots of cartoons and it and it has and it's got a crazy coloring and it's it's um it does have some talking heads, me among others, and my wife. I pay attention to my wife Rosemary, she's a big deal in this film as she is in real life. But the, ask yourself, why did, and I'm going to ask Pete right now, Pete, why did you use all those cartoons? Uh, well, first off, you know, it's very, we, um, we really wanted to convey social science. And if you have a movie with 13 graphs in it, you got to <laughs> animate them. But the main point is we really wanted to aim this at people who are young at heart. And, um, and so, um, and we're hoping that this is something that can reach a new generation of Bob's work that wasn't alive when Bowling Alone um, was out or were just young, like people in my generation. You know, When I was 10, when Bowling Alone came out, it, I wasn't ready to read a 600 page <laughs> book filled with graphs yet. So um, hopefully the movie can be an introduction to that. And show one of the things we wanted to just do aesthetically is civic life is so exciting. The history of civic life is so exciting. It is like coursing with life. Like when you look at this history, go to any of your local libraries and ask the history like room at the library to just bring out photos of old civic life. It was amazing. And like one of the reasons, in addition to saving America, um, in addition to helping your health, one of the reasons we want to get everyone joining again is it's totally fun. And, um, and it's totally exciting. And you know, one thing I like, um, one of our interviewees said that I just love is, you know exactly what's going to happen if you stay home any given night. <laughs> you don't know what's going to happen if you go to a club meeting. And so I want people to kind of seize that adventure too. And we wanted to capture that spirit in the movie. Uh, I can take one question. I, I don't have a question. Then Camille, I'll come over to you in a minute. Well, I don't have yeah. a question. For my life. But, but uh, Mr. Putman, Bob, I just want to tell you, I'm 89 years old, and I read Bowling Alone uh, when it came out. And it, I was just telling someone, it was, it's the most important book I ever read. It's my number one book. I recommend it all the time. And I lived through the time of bingo clubs and temple dances and uh, all the other bridge clubs, bingo. I mean, all the things people used to do. Uh, and obviously, a lot of it's going away. So I have gotten this opportunity to meet you through the through uh, Zoom. Camille. <laughs> we'll run a mic over. 
I mean, I, I just wondered that inherent in joining a club is that you become a member of a group and other people are not members of that group. So inherent in being a group member, you have people on the outside. And, you know, I belong, to a, I live in England, I belong to a cricket club in England. And, you know, you have all these bizarre things arising, petty politics, people not getting on, people being excluded. And being a group, I see the point you're making is presented as a sort of panacea, a very good thing. But isn't there a whole bad side to being a member of a group as well? Thank you. Uh, uh, can, I, sorry, can I speak? Yep. Because I really want to, I didn't have the name of the name, basket, but it's a very good example. It's a very good question, important question. There are different kinds of social capital. And one important distinction is between social networks that link you to people just like yourself. That's called bonding social capital. So my bonding social capital are my ties to other elderly, white, male, Jewish professors. And my, my bridging social capital, that's the other kind, ties that link you to people unlike you. My bridging ties are my ties to people of a different generation or a different religion or a different politics or a different profession or a different social class, et cetera. Cricket clubs are quintessentially bonding social capital. That is, they bring you in contact. Oh, you don't bring you in contact with anybody else. I've lived in England a lot. And I've even, sometimes it was a little boring, but I've even hung out around cricket clubs. And they're not, they don't cross any social line. They're exquisitely bonding. And so I agree with you. I don't think we need a whole lot more bonding social capital. The Ku Klux Klan is bonding social capital. The Nazi, Nazi party was bonding social capital. What we especially need is bridging social capital. And in America, more than ever, we need to have young people connecting to old people and vice, vice versa. I would love to have some more young people come over to my house because I'm getting old and lonely and I need that, need that company of young people. But it's also across gender and above all across political lines. So I don't, I don't shrink one bit from saying that I think bridging social capital is almost a panacea. Now, of course, nothing really is a panacea, but I, you can keep your, your cricket clubs, but lots of these things, that the kinds of organizations and groups that we're talking about are bridging and they, they really are crucial, not just good, but they're crucial for the history of, for the future of our country. Well, I think that is a fine point to end on uh, since we're running a few minutes late. And also I think provides the uh, fire in the belly that we all need to go out and do something differently. Um, Bob, thank you so, so much for joining us and uh, for all the work you've done.